good evening uh, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Irena Grudzińska Gross. I'm the director of the Institute for Human Sciences, and I welcome you this evening for uh, our uh, conversation and uh, speeches and lecture and discussion. I hope. Uh, um, entitled Getting to Know the European Union. This evening we are going to talk about Spain and Portugal. We were talking, this is the fifth evening uh, that we are, the fifth event that we are devoting to this uh, issue and this evening we are very, very lucky to have two speakers uh, who are quite extraordinary. The, uh, um, um, uh, 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 who are one uh, is uh, an ambassador to the United States from Portugal, the country that is now holds now the presidency of the European Union, uh, Mr. Jean de Valera, and we also have the uh, ambassador to, of, of Spain to the United States, uh, Mr. Carlos Westendorp. And uh, as usual, uh, the discussion will be moderated by Alan Berger, who is a senior uh, editorial writer for Boston Globe. Uh, as uh, those of you who have been at these e evenings know that uh, we are really interested in presenting uh, the countries that are members of the European Union uh, from uh, the, um, asking them to tell the story or t tell us uh, what does it mean for a country to be a member of the European Union? What does it mean for its uh, citizens uh, to belong to this uh, huge family of nations? And uh, uh, we used to have a lot of uh, politicians and people coming from Europe and uh, uh, political scientists, uh, diplomats, who are talking about European Union but from the point of view of uh, Brussels or from the point of view of uh, geopolitical uh, issues. And we were always very interested and wanted really very much to present to the, um, to the students, to the ac academic public and to the public at large uh, in the United States in a certain way something very concrete. What, what does it mean for these uh, countries to really um, you know, join uh, that body. So uh, we were view, we were inviting various countries, various members of the European Union, uh, supported in it. And here I have to uh, thank the European Commission delegation in uh, Washington D.C. Uh, because they are um, financing, they are supporting financially uh, this effort. Uh, the title, basically, the main question, the, the title is, uh, of this series is uh, Getting to Know the European Union. And uh, the main question is what does it mean in practice to be a member of the European Union? Uh, I wanted to say only one more thing before I introduce the speakers, and that is that uh, we mm, here at the Institute, we consider the uh, European Union uh, a huge success and uh, an undertaking that is truly uh, um, worth uh, analyzing and uh, studying and uh, uh, promoting uh, because it is a very unique and a very unusual uh, effort to join uh, countries uh, that used to be at war with each other and to enlarge uh, the well-being and the political uh, democracy to countries that uh, had more difficulties uh, and who are either aspiring members or new members to it. So uh, let me uh, introduce the speakers to you. Uh, our first speaker uh, will be Ambassador Joao de Valera, who first joined the diplomatic service in 1974. Both of our speakers are very experienced diplomats and their uh, curriculum vitae is very, very long and very distinguished. So I will just pull out some of the positions that I find um, more important just for this occasion uh, without really going through all of, all of them. Uh, so uh, excuse me that I'm not going to, <laughs> uh, to, to talk about all the entire careers of, uh, of the speakers. So the, um, uh, 
<laughs> Mr. De Valera was uh, appointed uh, the ambassador of Portugal to the United States in January of this year. Uh, and as I told you, uh, he uh, is representing since he's representing Portugal, and Portugal is the uh, has a president, rotating presidency of European Union, his uh, workload is, uh, I think, even heavier than usual. Um, he served also at the embassy of in Madrid, at the permanent representation of the European communities in Brussels. Uh, in 1998, he was appointed ambassador to Dublin. Uh, in 2001, he became director general of European Affairs and from February 2002 to May 2002, served, served as delegate to the Convention on the Future of Europe. Uh, he was then appointed ambassador in Berlin, a position he held until taking up the present position in Washington. Um, uh, Mr. Carlos Westendorf became ambassador of Spain uh, to the United States in September of 2004. Uh, he joined the Spanish diplomatic service in 1966. He previously served as a member of the Autonomous Community of the Madrid Parliamentary Assembly, uh, for, uh, and then as a member of the European Parliament and as high representative for the implementation of the peace agreement in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In addition, he has served as his country's permanent representative to the United Nations, Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as at various other posts uh, for European communities. And uh, our, you, many of you know our moderator, uh, Alan Berger, who, as I said, is a senior writer, uh, editorial writer for the Boston Globe. Uh, our discussion will uh, be as usual, uh, we will we'll, we will have the format that uh, we have two speakers, then we are going to have uh, probably a little exchange between them, and then uh, we are going to open the room for the, um, uh, for the discussion. Uh, our formal official part will end uh, approximately after an hour and a half, and then we have a reception outside, and for this reception, everybody is very cordially invited, and we can continue the, the conversation. Thank you very much, and Mr. Ambassador, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I hope I won't get lost in my manuscript notes, but I'll try to do my best. But I would like first to uh, commend the Boston University for this initiative. Uh, I think it contributes very usefully to raise the American awareness of the European Union um, when we celebrate its 50th birthday and the extraordinary success, that's something you have already mentioned, but I would like to repeat, of this unique experience of voluntarily shared sovereignty. And for doing it in a way that uh, does not conceal the basic elements of diversity, the changing nature and the underlying complexities of the European integration process, if I understood what happened in the meetings here before. It is also a privilege to be in this stage together with Ambassador Carl Westendorp, whom I frequently had the pleasure to meet in the course of his distinguished diplomatic and political careers and to address this audience when Portugal holds for the third time the presidency of the European Union. Since your arrangements favor the questions and answers segment of this session, uh, I shall be brief while at the same time trying to, uh, uh, with my introductory remarks, to uh, stimulate and to enlarge the, the scope of the subsequent discussion. Contradicting what many predicted or feared, and there were many in Portugal at that time, the Portuguese integration in the European Union was not bedeviled by any disastrous consequences nor did it lead to a breakdown when it came to adapting, adopting the country's economic and social structures, structures, or when the public administration was called to face wider and more demanding responsibilities, both in the front line in Brussels and in the numerous national backstages. On the contrary, overall, the, the experience was a major success and, was, and we soon found the right way within the working methods and specificities of the EU's complex institutional framework. 
We took advantage of the favorable conditions offered by the internal market and by the Union's structural policy while globally reacting in a positive way to a difficult new environment of permanent negotiation and of enhanced um, uh, competition. Even if sometimes with unavoidable hiccups and delays, we managed to make compatible and to gradually integrate within the European framework our specific foreign policy interests and concerns, intimately linked with the dense networks of historical relationships built up over the past centuries. An example of what I just said can be observed, for instance, within the priorities of the current Portuguese presidency, where the materi materialization of a new strategic partnership between the European Union and Brazil, or the persistent attempt to create a new global architecture for the relations between the European Union and the African continent occupy a prominent place. Finally, we not only adapted to the intense pace of change that shook the European Union in the past 20 years through successive cycles of enlargement and major treaty changes, the last one being the Treaty of Lisbon, which, as you know, or you probably know, will be signed on 13th of December next, but also played an active role in the definition of that process of change. Portugal made the strategic option and the necessary homework to join the more advanced expressions of integration within the European Union sphere, being a founding member of the Euro and of the Schengen space. And the economic progress, the impressive infrastructural build-up, the modernization of the financial system, and the human development that accompanied integration, despite inevitable difficulties and a pace we would prefer to be swifter, allowed it to move from the category of countries that were almost exclusively exporters of labor force and importers of capital to join the club of those who also import foreign workers and export capital. Following, by the way, a pattern that is gradually widening its geographic boundaries, the USA not being absent of the process of internationalization of the Portuguese enterprises in this moment. This evolution favored and was also favored by the positive attitude adopted in Lisbon towards the European integration process since the beginning. And it represents, I believe, one more expression of the adequacy and vitality inherent to the sui generis model of shared sovereignty that has been introduced in Europe, totally in opposition, and I think this is a very important point, to the zero-sum game logic that prevailed in the past before the signature of the Treaty of Rome with the tragic consequences we all witnessed and suffered from in the past century. This same evolution offers some interesting clues for those of you who might feel curious to approach the enlargement deepening dichotomy. A dichotomy which crucially lays in the center of the EU developments, past and future, and uh, wish to go, for you, a wish to go beyond the conventional wisdom that surrounds it. It is true that the two terms of this dichotomy are by definition, from a static point of view, contradictory in the sense that new members mean additional elements of heterogeneity and a multiplied set of different interests that complicate the decision-making process and bring a perceived risk of potential dilution to whatever was previously um, designed as a common purpose and ambition. But it is also true that enlargements were finally not condemned to be followed by a weakening of the global system. Conversely, they fueled compensation movements of adaptation that many times moved the integration process forward with a pace and a purpose that might have not been possible to reach in the pre-accession situation. And I would dare to say, and that's where I wanted to come at this point, that never was this so true as with the Portuguese and Spanish accessions, which were linked with three of the most ambitious and integrationist defining moments of European Union history. I mean the Single European Act, the Treaty of Maastricht, and the creation of the multi-annual financial perspectives exercise. But one of the most significant and immediate consequences of the simultaneous accession of Portugal and Spain regards the Iberian space. The wider European framework and the virtue, uh, had the virtue to provide the instruments and the political opportunity to tackle historical inertia, misunderstandings, and artificial separations that could not have been so easily and so naturally overcome 
were they the result of, uh, I would say, uh, a purely um, bilateral track. The relationship moved to a pattern of normality and acquired a degree of maturity and interconnection at the political, economic, social, and human levels that has no parallel in the long history of the two countries. For the first time, participating together in the, sa in the same geostrategic area of interest, not only the European Union, but also NATO, Council of Europe, OSCE, whose, whose presidency Spain is now in charge of, and the Ibero-American framework. Convergent interest in development of some important EU policies also helped to build a natural net net network of contacts and consultation between the two countries. This very positive outcome influenced other experiences of integration, namely the Mercosur, following a trail where the well-succeeded reestablishment of democracy in Portugal and Spain had already inspired and sustained the expansion of democratic regimes in Latin America and elsewhere. Portugal has taken large benefits from its accession to the European Union, this is well known, but has also given positive contributions to the European Union, not only through more visible brands like the Lisbon Strategy or what is to become the Treaty of Lisbon, but through daily work within European institutions, through added value brought to the development of relations with different areas of the world, and through gestures of commitment with the pursuit of the European integration process. The Portuguese foreign policy, based in four pillars of European integration, the transatlantic relations, the uh, Portuguese diaspora, and uh, what I could call the uh, development and organization of the wide Portuguese-speaking world, and the Portuguese European policy are very stable and basically immune to government change in Portugal, irrespective of their ideological color. I think it might be interesting for you to have this introduction concluded with a mention to the basic principles and objectives that, in my opinion, have constantly inspired the Portuguese action in Europe. I would mention a certain number of them. As I already said before, compatibility, integration, and ideally mutual reinforcement of the interests and preferential relations Portugal maintains with the outer world. Within this context, a strong Europe and a solid transatlantic relationship should be not only compatible, but mutually sustaining objectives. Development of common foreign security policy and European security defense policy in a transatlantic harmony. This is another point of our basic uh, approach to the European Union uh, policies. Defense of the principle of equality of states and of a balanced distribution of power among small, medium, and bigger member states, with plain rejection of attempts to form directory-like structures within the European Union. Preference for the so-called community method, as opposed to the reintroduction of intergovernmental practices within the European Union structure. Defense of solidarity and social and economic cohesion as a pillar of the European project. Defense of the Portuguese language within the institutional system. Participation in the front line of the integration process. Continued support to the countries that applied and qualified to enlargement. Caution, and I would say personally reserves, about the multiplication of flexibility models and exceptional clauses that may jeopardize the consistency and unity of purpose of the Union as well as the nature and degree of commitment implied by membership, and consequent demand to closely monitor their development and implementation. A favorable attitude towards the extension of European Union competencies beyond the mere economic sphere, with a particular interest in new areas like migrations, social affairs, fundamental rights, and the progressive enrichment of the concept of European citizenship, something that in the united Europe of diversities, I would say, we are aiming at is not something meant to replace, but to be added to the national citizenship in the benefit of our citizens. I may stop here. I think I've been too long. Thank you very much for your attention.
Good evening. Thank you very much to Boston University for this opportunity. Uh, it's a great thing to, to be able to speak together with uh, my Portuguese colleague because our, our destinies are linked together because we share the same piece of land in the Iberian Peninsula, as you know, and we joined the European Union at the same time. And we have had together the same type of experiences. Let me just uh, say a few words about our common experiences. One is that Spain and Portugal were the first two countries who had liberal constitutions in Europe uh, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. But uh, very soon we both entered into decadence and political, economic decadence and political fragility leading towards uh, dictatorships. Uh, we missed the uh, mingled in uh, European affairs in the First World War and the Second World War, and we uh, lived in isolation. More Spain than Portugal, because Portugal had special relationship with the uh, United Kingdom, and at the same time has been a more traditionally Atlanticist country than Spain. But we have sh shared a lot of uh, common experiences together. And the paradox is that we have lived uh, giving the back to each other for quite a long time. And joining the European Union was, has changed dramatically our respective situation vis-a-vis -vis each other. Spain and Portugal now look at each other face to face. We are close friends. We are close allies, and at the same time, we share the same type of uh, Europeanism, so to speak, and defend the same values within the European Union because we really believe that it is the best possible place to be, even if nowadays we are living difficult times. But uh, Europe has lived many difficult times, and we have overcome all of them, and I hope that with the Treaty of Lisbon will uh, put uh, Europe back to the uh, rails that we have been derailed a f three, or three years ago, I think, two years ago. Uh, we are trying to digest many things. One of them is the big enlargement, the big bang of the enlargement. And uh, this is not easy. We were 12 countries, more or less homogeneous, more or less coming from uh, the same experiences, perhaps except Spain and Portugal, because, as, as I told you, we, we came from dictatorships. But the European Union has been completely a revolution for both of us, because now we are living together, we're looking at, at the face, uh, to the face, face to face, and at the same time, we have been benefiting of belonging to this uh, family. In the first place, because uh, we have overcome the difficulties, the political difficulties of the uh, years, uh, or, or the first, uh, the first uh, half of the of the last uh, century, the second half of the last century, and at the same time, the uh, economic fragility of our two uh, nations. So the experience of uh, Spain and Portugal are very positive, and I am going now to refer mainly to, to Spain. Uh, when we joined the European Union, uh, we wanted to be uh, equal to the other countries of Europe, that is to say, to overcome our fragility, political fragility, and to uh, overcome also our economic backwardness. And both, uh, both uh, objectives has been attained by Spain's uh, joining the European Union. We had a, uh, an attempt of the, uh, to a, a coup d'etat in, in 81, as you will, perhaps you are too young to remember, or, but uh, I, I can tell you that this was uh, quite easily overcome thanks to the, the democratic uh, commitment by our, by our institutions and mainly by the King of Spain. 
and also belonging to the European Union, which is a kind of, uh, of a vaccine against, uh, against uh, autocratic uh, adventures. But at the same time, Spain, who was, when we joined, had a, an average income of 75% of the average income of the European Union, nowadays, in the year 2007, we are 100% in the average of the European Union. That is to say, we are totally uh, in the average income of the European Union. Spain has been growing uh, in the last uh, 10 years at a pace of 4%, uh, 3.5% of uh, the gross national product. Uh, the rest of the European Union countries, the average has been growing half of that amount of, uh, of uh, growth. So we have been able to catch up with the, um, with the average of the, of the other countries of the European Union. So this has been a very important uh, achievement of, uh, of Spain and also of Portugal. And now we uh, have also introduced into the European Union some other preoccupations, uh, some other responsibilities. and. Uh, Ambassador de Barrera has mentioned some of them. Uh, let me just add, the, uh, he, he has mentioned Mercosur, but of course uh, Latin America is also something that Spain can, and in Portugal, can uh, help to, uh, to uh, develop and to be more present in the, uh, in the international sphere because uh, Latin America Portugal with Brazil, and Spain with other Latin American nations, we speak the same languages and we have uh, an experience that may be also very uh, useful for the Latin American countries. And this is one of the assets that both countries, Spain and Portugal, may uh, present when talking to the United States. Uh, together, uh, we, can, we can do a lot of things in the Western Hemisphere and we, we can share the same type of goals, although sometimes we may differ in the approach how, how, how to get to these uh, common goals. For instance, democracy in Cuba. We both want a democratic Cuba, that's very clear, because we want for Cuba uh, the same as we have in our own country, that is to say democracy, freedom, uh, and uh, liberties. But perhaps we have a different approach. We don't think that by uh, an embargo policy is going to uh, attain the objective of democracy in Cuba. On the contrary, perhaps it is going to become more difficult to achieve that goal. But apart from that, we can, we can share the same goals so we can work together uh, in the democratization of Cuba, in the situation of uh, some uh, Latin American uh, countries which have a, a trend towards uh, autocracy, and uh, we can do a lot together because Spain is the second investor in Latin America, as you know, after the United States. And uh, our, our firms are very present. And when, whenever you have firms present in a, in a continent, you can have an influence, which is not only the language or the common culture, but it's also real, real politics. Uh, on the other hand, one of the, uh, of the advantages of being in the European Union is uh, to be able to sustain and to support one of the European Union's objectives, which is the transatlantic relationship. That is to say, a good relations with the United States and Canada. Because we belong to the same family of nations, we share the same values, and we, we are suffering the same challenges, the same scourges, the scourge of terrorism, of uh, organized crime, and the world is, uh, is too complex for one only country to cope with, this, uh, with these challenges. So we need to cooperate together and transatlantic relationship is the best, uh, the best uh, of all possible actions we can do because we share the same values as I told you. Um, Spain has been uh, an, an active member of the European Union but at the same time an active uh, believer in it, a good, sound, equal, balanced transatlantic relationship. 
this is why perhaps uh, the um, we had in the past uh, when uh, Spain uh, fulfilling a an electoral promise the new government of Spain had to withdraw the troops from Iraq we had a uh, certain uh, bumpy road in the relationship with the United States. But this has been overcome, well, first of all, because uh, it is evident that uh, also in the United States, it was not a, it's not nowadays a unanimously uh, sustained policy. Uh, on the contrary, it is less and less sustained. And at the same time, we all believe that we have to help each other in order to overcome the situation. So uh, we are doing that not only in Iraq. Spain is not participating with troops, but is participating, is supporting the uh, training and equipping and uh, reconstruction of the country. And we are also uh, working uh, together with the United States in other peacekeeping operations in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, in Bosnia Herzegovina. Because, as I told you, uh, the world is too complex for one only country to uh, be able to cope with these challenges. So uh, this is another characteristic of the, of the Spanish policy, that is to say that we want a sound, balanced uh, transatlantic relationship, but not too imbalanced as it was in the previous government when they had to uh, uh, follow the uh, direct policy of uh, intervention in Iraq, which was not accepted by the majority of the Spanish population, as you may remember. So uh, this is, uh, in a nutshell, the uh, main characteristics of our appartenance to the European Union. And now we are facing the ratification of the Treaty of Lisbon, which will um, replace the, uh, the constitution, the so-called constitution, which was um, refused by a couple of countries in the Netherlands and in France, as you will remember. And we had to uh, make some uh, concessions, some arrangements in order to save the essential goals of, the, of this constitution. And I think uh, I am quite confident that we, we can come to a happy end and uh, at last it will be ratified. It is not a sufficient condition for Europe to work. It is a necessary one, but it's not enough. It's not enough if there is not enough political will to act together. E Europe uh, has its own values his own uh, values which are shared with the United States, but values which are differently seen from the European continent. And together we can influence each other in order to uh, be able to have a better world. And this is why we need uh, the Constitutional Treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon, but we need also a political will to be able to act and to influence in uh, foreign policy and in world affairs. If Europe has this political will, and this is a big if, if Europe has this political will, I think we'll be able to influence other friends, for instance, the United States, for a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Um, I'm now going to ask a couple of questions just to get us started, and then uh, you and the audience can ask questions. You can go to this mic. We have only one mic today, and, and form a line, and uh, I'll call on you. Um, first question I want to ask um, is an attempt to tie together what you said about um, the Iberian Peninsula's special relations and, and um, concern for Latin America. Um, and the whole matter of European integration, one of the projects of the Constitution, and I guess the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, <coughs> is for a unified European Union foreign policy. Um, there was the project of one foreign minister. Um, now, 
uh, Spain's king just the other day told uh, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, could you please shut up? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my question is, if there were a unified foreign policy with one foreign minister, would Spain have a problem with that, uh, with the, that one foreign minister? And secondly, what kind of resonance does that statement from someone who's regarded as a, a symbol, even though a monarch, of, of the return of democracy on the Iberian Peninsula, what kind of resonance does his statement to Chavez have in Latin America? <clears throat> Well, I think the um, the king's words uh, were the words of somebody who belongs to the same family. Otherwise, uh, if you are not of the same family, you don't dare to to pronounce that kind of words, which are it may sound too too harsh. Uh, if you are not, this is why perhaps nobody has told Chavez that before. Um, well. He didn't say, shut up. He said, why don't you shut up? Which is, has a, has a, has a, has a, has a different uh, nuance. Uh, in any case, in any case, he was um, uh, really um, uh, listening to Prime Minister Zapatero trying to convey to Hugo Chavez, who had pronounced very nasty words against the uh, previous uh, Spanish Prime Minister Aznar, uh, calling him a fascist, that uh, Zapatero was trying to convey to Chavez that uh, even if we do not agree with uh, Aznar's policies and attitudes, because we belong to the antipodes, in ideological antipodes in our country, uh, you have to respect uh, a person who has been elected by the Spanish people. and. Uh, when he was trying, Zapatero, to convey this message to Chavez, which is quite a logical message, uh, Chavez didn't, didn't, didn't stop and he continued, he went on and on and on and speaking and uh, saying that kind of, uh, of nasty words and the, the king said, why don't you shut up? Which, by the way, is now a slogan in Venezuela. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's written everywhere and they said, why, why, <laughs> why don't you shut up? I think this is going to have some some conse internal consequences, but I hope we will be able to overcome the diplomatic incident. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, mm, you see, um, the United States and, and Venezuela, or the United States and Cuba, uh, have a different kind of relationship uh, from, from Spain's, because we belong to the same family. Um, we have a lot of uh, grandfathers and grandsons and uh, in, in Cuba or Venezuela, and uh, it is very difficult for, for the Spanish government, any government, no matter the color, uh, to, uh, to be in bad terms with a Venezuelan uh, or Cuban government, even if they, we would rather prefer other type of governments. Uh, but, you know, this is something that we cannot uh, have the, the luxury of uh, having difficult relations with them. So this is the, when, when we have um, discussions with our American friends, it is, uh, we have to convey to them that we, um, we cannot say the same type of things that an American government can say to them. But this is, uh, this is life. Uh, is this, yeah. Well, as also a member of the Ibero-American family, I, I, I don't want to develop this subject, but I would just like to recall that uh, uh, you probably don't know that, but uh, Portugal has in Venezuela our second biggest community in Latin America. After Brazil, it's in Venezuela. So this, is, this might be a, a curious element for you and desired by the hundreds of thousands of people. But uh, coming to your part of your question, I mean, you, you mentioned also the EU foreign policy. Uh, I, would, I would, before I, I would make a mention about uh, what we have in the new treaty in, in foreign policy and why the new treaty gives uh, better conditions to the European Union to enhance its position towards the external world. I would start with something the Spanish ambassador said before. He said, I mean, we have a treaty, we have instruments, we have a framework. But of course, if you have not the, uh, 
the, the will be, uh, behind it, uh, this will be just instruments. Uh, but even if we know that instruments and organs uh, tend to create their functions lately, so we have to have a, a good combination of the two. But since you mentioned these instruments, what I wanted to say is that uh, you said, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the European Union, this might or not happen. I mean, uh, what we do with the, this treaty is a step forward in terms of having a streamlined uh, common policy in foreign policy in, in the European Union. And basically with the fact that the European Union Minister of Foreign Affairs, actually he's not called that anymore, that was in the constitutional treaty which was, uh, as you know, refused, is called higher representative, but still has the basic same functions as, as it was foreseen in the constitutional treaty. Mm -hmm. But what basically, what is the big change? The biggest change is that uh, the gentleman who will be responsible for this task, he will do what more or less what three different people are doing now. I'm not saying that we are approaching uh, Kissinger's dream of having a unique uh, telephone number in, uh, in, 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 in Brussels to call, but we are somehow approaching this, this subject because he will, this new high representative will do what Mr. Javier Solana is doing now as high representative for foreign policy, what Mrs. Ferrero Waldner is doing as the commissioner responsible for external relations, and he's all, he will also be doing a, a part or a great part of what the present um, um, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the, pres of the country that holds the presidency has, because this uh, new um, uh, gentleman, as I said, will be, will be heading or chairing the Foreign Affairs Council Foreign Policy Council in Brussels. So there is this new elements which suddenly go into the direction of a bigger integration. But this does not mean, of course, I said this is a new step. This does not mean that foreign policies disappear in all member states. It's not true. There, there will be national foreign policies. But uh, as I said, the common element of foreign policy will be streamlined and reinforced with this new situation. And also with the creation of, uh, for the first time, of EU external service, where you'll have people from the Commission, Secretary of the Council, and diplomats from member states. Uh, are you a volunteer for that? I would, I would. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I forgot to, to, to say a word about that. I, I agree totally with Jean de Valera that um, the uh, organ may create the function, uh, but this is an necessary condition is not a sufficient one. Um, he also mentioned that political will is very important. And there are many obstacles at present to have this political will, this unified vision about what really, what we really need. Well, in the first place, um, there are members in the European Union, the new ones especially, who have logically a uh, very close relations with the, uh, with the United States, and uh, perhaps they feel themselves, uh, it's a feeling of gratitude because the United States was very uh, instrumental in uh, liberating these countries from the, from the Soviet uh, oppression. And uh, well, they are examples, and these countries, uh, sometimes they are closer to the United States than to the European Union. Uh, foreign policy. For instance, uh, we have seen that very clearly in Iraq war. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you, you I, I hope you, you will remember the, the distinction between the new Europe and the old Europe by uh, former Secretary of Defense uh, Rumsfeld. Uh, the new Europe being, of course, the countries from the Eastern and Central European states. And this is going to take some time. To, to be unified. I mean, this, um, these countries now also are uh, taking decisions uh, without consulting or without the assent of the other members of the European Union. For instance, uh, the anti-missile uh, basis and was not consulted in the framework of the European Union, and it was taken as a decision taken by, by Poland and the Czech Republic. So you, you can see examples of uh, that this, um, uh, these, uh, of these obstacles. You also uh, noticed that the uh, United Kingdom 
uh, sometimes is very reluctant to um, have a unified uh, foreign policy with the rest of the continent. But these obstacles, uh, if, if you are optimistic, and we need to be optimistic if we, we want to achieve results, uh, may be overcome. I don't, uh, I don't say that they will be overcome uh, very quickly, but they will be overcome uh, with time. With time, with patience, and uh, having a very close uh, uh, and very well-defined objectives. We are not going to have a unified foreign policy. We are not going to be only one state in the European Union, but we have to share at least uh, certain uh, aspects of foreign policy um, in the defense of democracy, in the defense of, uh, of our freedom, of, 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 our, of our values. And uh, if we do that, we will have the right influence in the world. Uh, if we don't do that, then, of course, the world will have an imbalanced situation and there will be others who will really uh, mark the path in foreign policy, and Europe will not be able to say a word or to influence in these trends. Sorry, we are going on. It's not a sort of dialogue, but uh, what uh, my colleague has just said uh, uh, brings new elements to this discussion. We are in your first question. But I mean, uh, that reminds me that uh, I forgot mentioning in, uh, in the basic orientations I have identified of the Portuguese vision of the European Union, I, I forgot mentioning gradualism. Gradualism in terms of construction of the European Union. Uh, and so as an answer to this question you put on, well, um, a common policy does not mean a unique foreign policy. But uh, gradualism in our, in our sense means steps forward towards integration and not, uh, and not gradualism in the sense that uh, we move in a certain direction but we are also making steps aside or even back, you know. So because many people criticize gradualism because they would be much more um, ambitious but uh, we should take care uh, of avoiding situations where an, an, an apparent uh, great ambition is somehow contradicted by some elements which are introduced in the treaty which could mean something different. So gradualism but in a positive direction and towards integration. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one other thing because uh, uh, we should go to questions from the audience and then you can go to that uh, microphone to ask questions. Um, and this is a bit of a softball I suppose. but. Um, a long time ago, my wife and I were in, um, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, and it seems to me that uh, Spain has been quite successful in creating a kind of balance between centralism and, and regional autonomy, um, and that it is a model of sorts that a lot of other countries with problems of uh, conflicts with um, minorities that want independence or autonomy uh, could learn from. Um, one thinks of, of Turkey today, or, or Sri Lanka, or Pakistan. Um, but um, I wonder, um, to what extent is this a model within Europe? And um, is, there, is there an influence? I know that Spain has asked Basque and Catalan languages to be part of the European Union um, set of official languages. Um, is this something that uh, that is... Uh, can be adopted uh, elsewhere in Europe? Well, um, we are living in a world where it's so complex that national states are becoming too small to solve big problems in the world. Uh, so this is why they need a broader alliances like the European Union or the transatlantic <coughs> relationship, etc. And so, and also at the same time, there are problems which are very near the citizen, uh, very, very close to the, 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 the most uh, uh, smaller units, uh, for instance, uh, the, the cities and, and, and even the regions, uh, which are difficult to solve at national, at national state and you need to um, 
to devolve these kind of questions to uh, smaller, uh, smaller units, political units. So this is why I think um, the uh, distribution of power within a country, such as in Spain, uh, it's, um, it's something which is going to be inevitable. Uh, United States is a federation. Uh, there are trends in other countries. For instance, uh, uh, in, in France, there are some regions which are now claiming for more autonomy in the United Kingdom also. Uh, I don't know if uh, what uh, is going to be the, the, the answer by, uh, by the majority of the people in these countries, but in Spain, uh, it is clear that language is a, is a matter of, uh, of national identity and it's, it's difficult to uh, to give an homogeneous uh, system to the whole uh, nation if you have uh, units which are very different culturally and linguistically. Uh, I don't think this is a model for anybody, but it is a, it is a um, is a something that uh, was inevitable for Spain, and whenever other country uh, asks us uh, about the experience, we say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult experience because we, it's, it's not an easy question to solve. Um, there are people, as you know, in, 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 in Spain, in the Basque country, who would like to have independence and also in Catalonia. Fortunately, they are a minority. Um, and unfortunately, a, a very small mi minority are not accepting that to do that peacefully, but they uh, they use the the terror as, as a weapon to uh, to attain their objective. So this is a problem we are having, and uh, it is it is more or less solved little by little, but it's not yet settled. Ambassador Wessendorf mentioned uh, a certain number of similarities between the uh, historical trajectory of Portugal and Spain, and I very much agree with them. But as he also pointed out, there are some differences. Well, um, one of them being, for instance, and since we go to, if we consider the, the, evolu the, the evolution after accession, Spain, for instance, took enormous benefit in the agricultural sector that Portugal, unfortunately, did not at the same time at the same level. Uh, another difference being the fact that, for instance, um, even during the di dictatorship, uh, Portugal was already member of NATO and member of EFTA, so we had an experience of uh, e European economic integration a bit, uh, well, it, was, it is not nothing to be compared with the European Union, but nevertheless we had this sort of uh, experience of economic opening, which was uh, sometimes some years ahead, ahead of Spain. Well, another difference being uh, we, we both had the two constitutions, the two first uh, constitutional demo, um, constitutions in Europe, but uh, another difference is that, for instance, Portugal abolished death penalty as in 1863, which is 1863, yes. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a long, long time ago. But, I mean, this point that has just been raised is another of the historical differences between and you Portugal don't and kill Spain. The bulls in the <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's also true. Well, not now. We did in the past. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, this is where, of course, there is an historical difference. The, the Portuguese experience is of a, a unified state, uh, with the exception of the Azores and Madeira, which are uh, regions in Portugal. And, uh, but, uh, and we even had the experience of a referendum in Portugal, which tried, uh, I would say, against this, against this current or this stream, try to introduce a regionalization process in Portugal and was refused by 70% of the Portuguese people who are more linked. But I mean, the fact that this idea was launched has to do with what has been said before. I mean, even in Portugal, there is a, an obvious discussion about uh, how you have to deal with proximity. And uh, if it is not regionalization, uh, a movement towards decentralization is, is certainly happening. I invite you to, those of you who have questions, to go to the microphone. Um, if not, or as you think about it. Yes, go ahead. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, but you might as well speak to the mic. I would just like to ask Ambassador uh, Westendorf. Go to the mic. Say, sorry. Ambassador uh, Westendorf to say uh, a little bit more about Catalonia. That is, 
How do you explain the fact that given the almost irrelevance of sub-regional entities within a state, given the essence of a single market, European Union, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it now that Catalonia is becoming so more autonomous or wishing more autonomy? Excuse me? What, did, what is the word? Why, is why is Catalonia pushing for autonomy when it doesn't seem to make sense? If you think of a single market, a unified entity, et cetera, in Europe. Um. I can explain it to you because I am not Catalan. I am from Madrid, so I, in, in principle, I am a jack, a jack man. <laughs> but I, I think I, am, I, I know uh, the Catalans well, and I, I, um, I really, um, I really understand uh, many of their preoccupations. When they have, if you look into the Spanish history, a separate evolution uh, in, 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 in the old times. And they have a, 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 a language of their own and a very rich literature. Uh, they have been um, the locomotive of the Spanish uh, economy for, for many, many years. They were, uh, in the uh, Industrial Revolution, they were the first to... Uh, to introduce machinery more or less in, in line with the, uh, the machinery used in the textile industry in the United Kingdom. So um, it is a, a region in Spain with a very strong personality. And uh, the majority of the Catalan people would, um, would like to, uh, to live together with Spain, uh, to live within Spain. Uh, but, of course, they would like to have a uh, certain degree of self-government. And this is what they have now. So um, it, it, it is totally compat compatible to be, uh, to feel as a, uh, let's say, uh, comfortable in, in the Spanish nation, but to have their own uh, institutions. It is more or less the same which is happening in, in the United States, with the difference that in the United States, the states have not a different language. Although in Florida, I don't know it. But, uh. <laughs> uh, may I? I know that this is uh, becoming kind of like a main topic, but may I continue talking about it, but from a slightly different point of view? Uh, there is a, I heard uh, during the wars in uh, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, now I heard an interpretation that the Yugoslavia and the federations in Europe uh, had to uh, dissolve themselves if their members wanted really to become real members of the European Union. The minister, uh, you know, as you've heard, I consider European Union as the most amazingly positive phenomenon, but that the, there was a negative side to it, that is that there were the federations that couldn't dissolve peacefully like Czechoslovakia were dissolving violently because these countries felt that they need to establish themselves as nations so as to become then members of the as uh, nation states. Anyhow, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but uh, this is part of an interpretation that the European Union itself will dissolve these nation states, that it will become an organ that what is happening now in Belgium, for example, that this, this is part of the same phenomenon. So I'm proposing it as an, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't agree in the sense that, uh, in the sense that uh, I don't think that the Yugoslav Federation dissolved because they were aiming already at uh, being part of the European Union. And uh, we would even wish today in the European Union that uh, when we deal with a problem, a problem like Kosovo, that, uh, that uh, the adherence to a European Union project would be so wished by all intervenients that we would find uh, a common solution for all this. I mean, uh, so and uh, well not wanting to speak about uh, a member state where i lived for many years and which i, 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 I and which i i, I have great um, uh, connection with uh, 
I don't know if in the Belgian case what you are saying is right or if it is the contrary. I mean, maybe if there was not European Union, maybe the Belgian had already separated. I don't know. Maybe it's, it's, it's uh, held together because they have, among other things, the great advantage of having the capital of the European Union. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't take this uh, cause-effect uh, element you, you mentioned in, the, in that way. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I suppose one might say that one of the reasons why European foreign policy, common European foreign policy, often seems vague and decisive or just merely responsive is because it has to harmonize and it represents, therefore, the uh, smallest common denominator, you might say, between nations that have otherwise different views. But yet, at the same time, what makes European foreign policy interesting, it seems to me, is precisely the diversity of, of vectors, if you will. You mentioned yourself, both of you, uh, the privileged links uh, that Spain and Portugal have with Latin America, which in effect gives the European Union, if you will, a sort of Latin American uh, advantage or, or dimension. Now, there's another area in which uh, both of your countries, as well as, well, at least three others, if you would, in the EU, also have a sort of common specialty, you might say, and this, their, that's their relation with Africa. Uh, is there any way in which you think that Spain and Portugal, <coughs> although their connection with Africa really go in very different directions in many ways and don't overlap all that much, uh, have a way of influencing uh, the common European policy vis-à-vis -vis Africa, especially in terms of development? Africa is yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with that. No, but I took y y your point was very interesting. I mean, we have... Uh, there is, of course, a, a permanent uh, tension or a dialectic relationship between what is heterogeneity within the European Union and, of course, the added value that each member state and with uh, its own areas of interest and its own historical experiences can bring to the European Union. So this is part of the, of the whole process. But you mentioned Africa. Actually, I, I, I had mentioned it already uh, as uh, it is in the center of, the, of, of our external priorities during the during the present semester. And uh, Portugal has been persistently insisting on uh, the building up of a, a new architecture, global architecture, between European Union and Africa. And uh, I'm saying persistent because uh, the first ever, up to now, European Union-Africa summit took place in our last presidency seven years ago. And uh, the second one is to take place now in Lisbon, uh, also in December. But I mean, I'm not just speaking about summit as a as a formula or as, a, or as um, an instrument again. What we are aiming at basically is with the, in this second summit is to approve two important documents. One of them is for the first time a joint European Union Africa strategy. There was a European strategy for Africa. We, we approved it in 2005, but the idea now is to have a, a, a joint strategy that is uh, owned by the two sides, and also to uh, enlarge the many relationships that exist between Europe and its member states and Africa in a global, uh, within a global framework. So this is the, the basic idea. And what we intend to approve in Lisbon is a joint strategy and an action plan for the next three or four years with concrete measures. Why do I mean global? Uh, what do I mean by global? It is. European Union on one side, all African continent on the other, and dealing with matters who have to do, I mean, with uh, good governance, with development policy, with uh, migrations, with pandemics. I mean, it's the, the whole uh, package. And uh, why, um, why uh, a double ownership? Because this is also a way of somehow overtaking or overcoming the, um, the trend that prevailed in the past, which was, which was uh, mainly a relation between, and this was very clear on a post-colonial situation, a relation between uh, uh, an entity which was a donor and another entity which was a recipient. Here, the idea is to put this thing together. Yes. And the basic, the basic preoccupation and uh, aim behind all this is, of course, to help creating the best conditions for the African continent to be integrated within the international system and to take benefit also of the globalization process where we are all involved, and to avoid, of course, 
the dis disastrous consequences that would happen if that w would not be the case, including with, you know, weak states and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. When I said that uh, jokingly that, that Africa is Portuguese, really Portugal has a, a, is a country with a very clear African vocation, more than Spain, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which Spain is, uh, was, was, has been absent except in Equatorial Guinea. But uh, of course, Portugal has uh, a much longer experience. And this is why we, we are going to follow uh, Portuguese initiatives in the African summit and the global initiative. That, that's clear. Spain is, is supporting us since the beginning. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this is one example of how we can, we can do uh, foreign policy together. Spain is mainly concerned with the north of Africa with the Maghreb countries because of the proximity and also the historic links with Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia. We are fostering the uh, unity of the Maghreb because uh, they are countries which are not having any trade at all or any relations whatsoever among themselves which impoverish them and is not good for countries like Spain which are at uh, seven miles from, from the Maghreb to have a region which is not integrated and is not working economically and politically. And we also have another interest nowadays, which is a, the, the migration pressure from, uh, from Africa, uh, which is, a, is becoming a problem in our societies because they are uh, logically coming because of the huge difference of income between uh, the Af Africa and, and Europe. But we have to control these, the flux of these immigrations, otherwise we are going to have internal problems in our country. So uh, this is why um, the interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis Africa and a sound development in Africa is so important because uh, if there is no development in Africa, there will be uh, incentives to come to the, to the first world. Yeah, as, as I said before, migration is also one of elements of uh, interest of Portugal in uh, extending EU competencies and, uh, and finding common approaches to, this, uh, to these uh, new challenges. Uh, uh, another point I would like to add, uh, and again, is a point where the, the Portuguese and Spanish uh, views on European developments are uh, very convergent, has to do with uh, Northern Africa and with the fact that both Portugal and Spain have been uh, supporters within the European Union of a, a balanced, I mean, in the new neighborhood, Euro European neighborhood policy of keeping a balanced approach between what is, uh, well, the eastern uh, neighborhood of the European Union and the south, uh, and the south uh, neighborhood. So we have been very much supportive of the keeping a strong uh, element of intervention in, this, in, the, in the southern borders of Europe. Yes. I was wondering um, what Ambassador Westendorp thinks of the recent push in the Basque country for the integration of the Basque language and the Basque government, and if that is um, cohesive with the goals of the European Union and of the Spanish government. Well, the Basque language is uh, freely uh, used in, in Spain for, it's not recent, it's uh, during uh, the transition. Hasn't there been recently a push in the Basque country to integrate the Basque language in, in the courts and in government agencies and that it's like going to be a requirement for government officials to speak the Basque language in order to... And, and also in Catalonia, the, the Catalan language, and in Galicia, the Galician language, yes, yes. Uh, this is, uh, as long as the Spanish language is not banned, uh, then they, they, they can talk uh, Catalan or Basque in, in, in courts. But, okay. I mean... Why losing the Spanish language, which is spoken by 400 million people in the world? Right. Okay. Um, I would like to address my question primarily to His Excellency the uh, Ambassador of Spain. Uh, and uh, my question essentially concerns the protection of minorities, minority policies within the European Union. Now, this has been touched upon by several previous questioners, uh, perhaps I better identify myself. Uh, I'm a, an American of Hungarian extraction, 
And uh, as I'm sure the ambassadors know, but perhaps not everybody in the audience knows, uh, Hungary was uh, uh, partitioned after the First World War at uh, Trianon, which is in Versailles, uh, whereby it lost 72% uh, of its territory and about 60 some odd percent of, of its population, of which uh, uh, one third of the ethnic Hungarian uh, population became separated from the mother country. Now, uh, these uh, 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 population segments survive and, and of course form uh, fairly large contiguous minorities in the surrounding countries. And uh, after the liberation from uh, Soviet uh, uh, overlordship, essentially, and entry into the European Union, it seems that uh, the uh, minority rights of these people do not seem to be as, do not seem to be improving. Essentially, uh, European policies, whatever the European policies are for the protection of minorities, do not seem to be. Uh, especially effective in securing the rights of these uh, uh, Hungarian-speaking, essentially Hungarian-speaking uh, minorities, uh, some of which, uh, notably uh, those in Romania and uh, in, in Slovakia, uh, essentially are pressing for some kind of autonomy. Uh, the the nation-states, uh, of course, uh, are adamant about uh, the, the indissolubility of, of their nation states, even though these, these uh, population segments obviously do not belong to their nation. But in any case, my specific question is, uh, do you foresee any European policies for the furtherance of uh, the protection, for, for the uh, furtherance of minority rights uh, within uh, the European Union. And of course, I welcome the, the opinions of His Excellency, the Ambassador of Portugal, if he has uh, anything to add. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I think the, um, the protection of minorities is one of the main uh, objectives of the European values and the European Union. And as far as the Hungarian minorities, uh, we firmly believe, and I, 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 perhaps I, am, I was wrong, but uh, I thought that the, uh, in the framework of OECD, first OEC, and uh, in the framework of the different arrangements, this situation in Romania, the Hungarian minorities, and in, 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 in Slovakia, and also in Vojvodina, in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, which is now integrated into Serbia, uh, I thought this uh, the situation was uh, much more uh, recogn better recognized than it was uh, previously, but I, I may be wrong. I don't know. I, perhaps the ambassador of Portugal knows about that. No, it's certainly not about that, but the, the question here is to know, I mean, I think you, you, went, uh, uh, you, you went a bit uh, ahead in defining what the rights of these minorities would be, and uh, I mean, I don't go to the point of uh, defining if, uh, if a right of autonomy inside a state for a, a specific uh, ethnic minority is something to be recognized or supported or not. I mean, there I think we are going a bit too far in what, in what is the definition of uh, protection of minorities. That's, uh, I think that's a question that will we'll go uh, a bit uh, further on. Uh, uh, what would be the EU competencies, I mean? Uh, but uh, the, the point I wanted to make is that, uh, and since uh, we mentioned the treaty, and, uh, and since I'm supposed to know what is inside the new treaty, maybe a bit better than you, uh, I would like to say that, uh, well, it's not only foreign policy uh, structures that changed, uh, not only more, uh, not only more um, uh, qualified majority votes that are going to take place, not more... Uh, uh, powers to the European Parliament. Uh, there is uh, one new element in the in the in the treaty, which is introduction in the fundamental principles and objectives. For the first time, there will be a mention to human dignity, equality, and rights of minorities. It is inscribed. It will be inscribed in the treaty. I think for the first time, uh, so clearly. Then the question is how to implement and what it means exactly. Apart from what we all know that protection of minority is. I mean. 
Good evening. Um, I'm a student from Emmanuel College, and I'm originally from Warsaw, Poland. And my question is quite simple. Um, considering the deadline that the UN has in order to solve the situation in Kosovo, and considering if they should lean towards Serbia's call for more autonomy or independence, what is the U what is the European Union stand on the situation in Kosovo, and how would it work in order to envelop the country if it would become to if it would become independent um, in order to ensure security and prosperity and democracy within the region and for the EU at large? At, um, at, this, uh, at this stage, as you know, there is a, a structure called uh, Contact Group Troika for the, for the Kosovo issue, where there is a representative of the European Union, there is a representative from Russia, and a representative of the United States. They are doing their work, which will be concluded on the 10th of December. And what the European Union is doing is giving all its support for these conversations to have a positive outcome. And a positive outcome would be, first of all, of course, uh, an agreed solution. And at the same time, the European Union is uh, offering a European perspective for, as a way of trying to solve that problem. But uh, in this moment, and while these uh, contacts are taking place, and uh, where we are in such a delicate uh, situation of trying to use the last days of, uh, of this framework to trying to find a, a solution, I don't think it would be useful here for me to start, you know, uh, speculating about this. Thank you. Ah. What you said, sorry. Sorry, you're welcome. Which is, uh, we are also uh, inside European Union, and this is as a responsibility of a presidency. This is very much a responsibility of a presidency, trying to to find or to ensure, in the near future, uh, a common position within the European Union mm -hmm. to this problem. Not only for the sake of unity, not only because as many people consider. Uh, a unified position uh, regarding Kosovo may be one of the tests of the good functioning of a future uh, more ambitious common foreign policy that uh, will be uh, uh, inaugurated by the new treaty, but because we believe that uh, a common position by the European Union has an operational value in itself in trying to help solving the problem. Yes, thank you. I'm René Haferkamp, representing more or less the European Commission in this country. And I was very interested in what you said about Kissinger's telephone number. And you today, you gave the principal role to the man who would be the new Solana, or even Solana himself. Others have been here and said exactly something different. They said the more they are, the more difficult it will be. And the idea that was the principal idea of others was that the president of the council, who will be now permanent for two and a half years, and maybe for five years, will be the one one is going to call up. And if that is the case, what is happening to Mr. Barroso? So I'd like to have a little bit more details about this famous question I'm always asked here. Thank you. <laughs> You are asking me difficult questions when I, when, when I see a television camera there and, and, and what else. No, um, that's a very interesting because uh, we could go on discussing uh, changes of the treaty. And uh, I even mentioned the gradualism and uh, moves forward. And I even mentioned uh, the concept of uh, steps aside or even some movements backwards. But I mean, this, I would only speak on a very personal basis in, in this point. I mean, when you create this figure, of course, it is to facilitate, I mean, the, the high representative with this uh, concentrating the tasks of uh, basically two plus one um, political responsibles nowadays goes very much in that direction. Another thing is the creation of the post of the uh, elected more or less permanent at I don't know, it, now we, we tend to call it a permanent, but uh, he's elected for two and a half years. I don't know if two and a half years 
uh, is something that will allow you to be called permanent. But I mean, uh, and now I'm speaking on very personal terms. Uh, the creation of this figure uh, has been one of the compromise of this treaty, the elements of compromise. And uh, it is uh, something very new in this structure and which we will see how how it will develop and how it will work and how it will uh, uh, be inserted within uh, the already complex uh, institutional framework of the European Union. Personally, and uh, again I stress that I'm speaking personally, you have, well, you can see in it an, an advantage, uh, something in the direction of more integration, as I said. Uh, if you consider that this means that the Council will be, um, uh, well, will be in a better condition to operate itself. On the other hand, you can consider that there will be some gray areas of competence between this uh, figure horizontally with both the High Representative and the President of the Commission, Mr. Barroso, who in the future will be in the, in, in, in the, uh, responsible for the Commission, but also vertically, I would say, in, uh, as far as the, the exercise of presidency is concerned because the, the presences do not disappear with the new system. You will have, uh, I mean, I said already that the Foreign Affairs Council will be uh, chaired by the High Representative, but the other councils, uh, the, the presences are, are, are maintained until the level of the Council of Ministers. So it is only when a subject, for instance, financial perspectives, Carlos, this is something which is interesting for, and where we have a, a very rich experience, both of us personally in the past, um, we can uh, ask ourselves how this will work because uh, a presidency will be, when we reach the final stage of a decision, the presidency who is responsible, who is in charge, will prepare the dossier or the file to be approved. But we know that financial prospects, for instance, are approved at uh, the highest level. That means European Council. And so it will be interesting to know how it will be handled to this new figure will be responsible for the presidency of this chart. This is the vertical element. But the horizontal element, I agree with you that they are, uh, I would say, challenging and uh, imaginative situations which we will have to follow. Yes, we have Sorry. Also Don't speaking go. personally. <laughs> <laughs> I am not in favor of the new figure of the president of the, of the union. Uh, because it introduces confusion, it's not necessary, but it was uh, a result of a compromise. But my position is against, but it is, it, it is not uh, sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is a different animal we are introducing in the picture for what we knew in, within the European Union, that's true. It's another telephone number. <laughs> 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 well, this will be the last question. Yes, one last quick question for the ambassadors. Um, with, with the transformation of the European Union, how do you believe that your roles as diplomats in the United States will transform as a result of your membership to this large network? Um, the, the idea that f prior to being members of the U European Union, you had these roles as individual countries dealing with a superpower, and now now that you are members of this large conglomerate of countries, the strength in numbers, how, have you noticed any changes as a result of, of your new role? I, I think the main repercussion is uh, on the presidency. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, <laughs> Ambassador de Valera would be able to answer that, and I will tell you my opinion about that. <laughs> Something of this kind was, was <laughs> going to happen. No, I, I think we have to distinguish uh, three different situations. Where, well, uh, one is the bilateral relationship, and uh, this goes on as, uh, as ever. And uh, uh, as you may imagine, all, all countries and, uh, and the member states of the European Union are no exception. All countries represented in Washington have a very heavy bilateral agenda, and that means that we are all very busy dealing with that. And for a long time, you can even think that uh, this has not uh, very, uh, that does not connect uh, 
there's not a, 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 a great connection with the, the fact that you belong to the European Union in many aspects. That's, that's, that's one aspect. The second is, as a, a normal member state dealing with the United States, well, when you are discussing um, the, the international agenda, even on a national basis, it's difficult for you to speak with the United States without knowing what European Union positions are and uh, what is your own view inside European European Union. Because, as it was mentioned by Ambassador Westendorp before, we are in a world of growing in interdependence and in a world where basically all these global challenges are discussed on a, on a daily basis between Europe and the United States. And this, and I, I move to the third point, uh, presidency, which means, I mean, the European Union and the United States, I think, have, uh, I would say, the, the closest network of relationship that, that I, I would say exists in the world. Uh, all sorts of contexts and all sorts of um, uh, institutional and less institutional networking, but they are very, very much present. And so in that period, and especially during your presidency, I can assure you, when we deal not only with, with the, but now I would speak bilateral matters in the sense of EU, United States, but when we deal with the, the international agenda, the, the international crisis, and the, the global challenges, I can, I can assure you that there, is a, that there certainly is a big difference from what it was in the past. It is true, especially on, on these issues which, uh, in which we, the European Union has uh, shared competence. I mean, uh, for instance, in trade. Trade issues is, is, is dealt with the, by the Commission. Uh, individual member states have not, not much to say because we have transferred the competence to, to the Commission and then the Commission negotiates with the, um, with the United States directly, uh, which is the European Union with the United States. In other, in other issues which are less, uh, uh, less European, so, so to speak, and they are more bilateral, uh, there is, a, on the one hand, an interest from the United States to deal with countries separately, uh, according to the different situations. Uh, they prefer to go, for instance, with two or three uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Iran problem, for instance, or in, in, in many other aspects. And the European countries, on the other hand, they also prefer to uh, deal bilaterally with the United States. And uh, so you, you can find both, both uh, types of situations. Uh, those issues which are global, as uh, Ambassador Valera said, are dealt with uh, the United States uh, together. The presidency organizes a lot of meetings uh, at different levels. And this is why I said that the main repercussions is on the presidency, that we has a strong burden to, to uh, unify. It. But on the other hand, there is a tendency uh, from the United States and from European countries individually to deal bilaterally. I think you're both too polite to say in the last six or seven years the United States, in the name of being the only superpower, ceased to be a superpower. <laughs> um, thank you very much, both of you, and thank you for the audience. Thank you.